Welcome back to RC Pilots Lounge. You are here today with us for a special edition Thursday up in here. You know what's going on. We've got releases when we're doing a show on Thursday. We're going to keep it short and sweet compared to what you're used to with the Pilots Lounge. Uh, we do have our buddy goes on at 9 o'clock, so uh, we're not going to go that long. We have Jason Merkel uh, from Horizon Hobby in the wings waiting to come on and talk to you all uh, about the hot ticket new Falk Wolf 190A. Got to get it with it dialed in. Speaking of dialed in, you should have seen my second flight. It was fantastic, mm -hmm. and I'm making you wait for the shakedown. And as of yet, the, the video I put out is doing okay, so... Uh, it'll be a while before I do the shakedown, day or two or something like that. So, um, guys, how, I, I can't see how it's a little bit different. I got RC Air Marshal producing again. Uh, thank you so much, Dave. And it looks like we got a bunch of guys in the room. We'll do a little bit of a roll call. And then we're going to jump into this Falk Wolf. Uh, get your questions ready for me and Jason. And as you know, when we have guests on board, it's uh, not – necessarily the easiest thing to keep up with the chat so don't get mad some of you guys have been mad you've had hurt feelings you had your mom write me an email about how i miss you in the chat and that's not okay so i'm telling you now i might miss something <laughs> eqrc fred baron turning bank p51d keith christie gb linden noons what's going on man david snyder keith christie paul murray lj hobby life War Buzzard, uh, let's see, David Snyder, Fred Barron, a lot of repeats there. Captain Photon, I hope you're doing well, man. LJ, Lee Davidson's Hanger, Eddie K, Pay It Forward, Chuck G, Jordan Dole, what's going on? Oh, tongue. Look out for what? War Buzzard, no fear in him, I've convinced you. I hope so, man. You know what to do, man. Click that link. Uh, your butt's hurting, says War Buzzard. Is that your wallet? Been deflated? No fear in him. Victor RC Jet writes, uh, George Watts, Keith Christie, RC Project, Warbird Racer, Hanger 51, what's going on? You're still hypnotized? That means you watched the whole video. Good for you. Barry Campbell, Dylan Story, Paul Hatcher, what's happening? Mary Boozer. Yeah, Dennis Farley, welcome to the party on 6S Airplanes today. He told me, he's like, I cannot resist any longer. I'm pulling the trigger on that Falk Wolf. Uh, and he did it. Discover RC, what's going on? Kevin J. Okay. World domination, one like at a time. Hopefully we can get people to click the stinking links is what we'd, I'd like to see, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so without further ado, I think it's time to probably gear up the, uh, the mainframe behind the scenes and bring on Jason Merkel. I want you guys to let it rip. I'll try to MC some questions and... Uh, Jason, what is going on, man? Good to see you. Hey, good to see you too. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I uh, I, I got partly into the, your video. I can't wait to see the rest of it. Jason does a good job on the videos at Horizon Guys. So not only is there the you know the more official video, but you gotta turn on the notification there too because they put out a lot of little content that I call sneaky. It's kind of new for oh, them. Yeah. I, you don't necessarily expect it, but it's like really fun stuff, right? Like on the fly flight talk your overview today so i invite you guys that that are, are still digging uh information to find about this falk wolf to definitely check out the work jason has done uh on video and and of course if you haven't seen my video yet go check that out sometime and be standing by because i've got more in the queue just ready we flew it a lot that day did you, uh, I, I take it then you didn't reference it. Did any of you guys see the Easter egg we put out yesterday? Oh, no. Oh, some people in the chat definitely have. They posted about it on RC groups. Um, Dudes, uh, RC groups, that's why I missed it, dude. It's, it's not, it's not FW190 related. We'll put it that way. Okay. But it is cool nonetheless. Um, but I can I neither confirm nor deny if it's actually true or in there or what it might be. Uh, but yes, uh, Pilot Ryan is right. We we try our best, obviously, to keep things under wraps for as long as possible. Uh, it's important to us because uh, you know you, you got to protect your secrets, your your assets, your uh, um, your intellectual property, so to speak. You know we don't want necessarily everybody to know what we're working on all the time. But every once in a while, we do let things slip. Uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, I think we've dropped a couple of hints that something 
different was coming. Something... You guys have really dropped some for anyone paying attention. Yeah. Man, reading between the lines was all caps. If you were, <laughs> if you were paying attention at all, man. I mean, it was. You about. I mean, it was so. Petrado the other day really just last nail in the coffin. Uh, yeah. On the real flight. Yeah. Yeah. The, with the nine comment, it was kind of over. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> he. I think that day. One of us almost slipped that day. It was somebody, uh, and that would have been bad because that was. Oh gosh, that was almost three four weeks ago. So that would have been a little too early for people to know about it. <laughs> It's fun so, though, and and I think everybody, everybody always likes to know. And I've heard guys say this a lot, where they w- wish they knew uh, what people were working on further in advance, so they could appropriate funds better, or save up. And um, I mean that makes sense; that's valid. But when you think about the business of RC and how like truly, uh, the the competition for market share is real in business, no matter what it is. If if you're selling the you know, the smiley face sponge for scrubbing pans, it's real, just like it is with with model airplanes. So you do have to hold it close to the vest. And, um, you know, one, once it's appropriate, it, I think I can tell, I think everybody who pays attention can really tell that you guys have fun with us over those things, you know what I mean? Sneaking them in here and there and stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, when I was a kid, I always thought it would be uh, so awesome if I knew everything that a big company was working on and and how that insight would just be so incredible to have to, to be able to share that with people. And then now, obviously, we have a lot of projects in process, and I'm anxious to talk about all of them, but I can't. Uh, and that is for the business reasons you mentioned. Uh, yeah. It's very important that we protect that. But at the same time, when it's imminent and it's a couple of weeks out and we know it's not going to step on the toes of anything else or, or leak the wrong thing at the wrong time. Yes, definitely look for <laughs> those little tidbits. We, we leave those little Easter eggs every once in a while. And that's another reason why you got to follow these guys on social all over. Just just cause, so you don't miss it, because it is fun. Um, and I, I really do think a lot of guys probably had an idea uh, uh, what was coming? I, there was scuttlebutt that it would be a 109 or a 190, and then mm-hmm. deductive reasoning kind of speaks towards uh, not the 109. J- just on the ground handling aspect, you know, they fly right. good, but you guys tend to want to put out something that you know is going to perform well for people. You know, uh, it is performance most of the time. You know, you're at a club with other guys, so it's nice when you look good. Uh, speaking of looking good, I couldn't believe that w- when a good thing gets better, it always blows my socks off. Like the way the Falk Wolf goes together, mm-hmm. even easier. I mean, it was like one linkage um, yep. and a couple screws, even easier than the Mustang. And then um, the plastic bits on the uh where the wings join the outer panels mm-hmm. they're like a hundred percent plastic clad on both mating surfaces and then super blown away that the cockpit hatch on the fuselage and on the hatch itself are a hundred percent like protected by this like plastic you know edging mm-hmm. i think that's the bee's knees and then and then your the 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 drop tank or not or not little, yep. little tiny details like that, and then the little light on the rudder. I just over the moon, the fan on there and the motor, and and how that opens up into that battery bay. You know your ESC and battery is is getting t- plenty of air in mm-hmm. that bird. Yeah, so, it does seem to run a little cooler that power system in the FW than in the uh, P fifty one. Yeah, I mean it's opened up. It makes sense. The uh, we did fly them together, Bobby and I, and there's more video to come on that. And and we, we, you know, I tell you what, you get some of these that are just like you. You could be okay to have to spend a quarter of the year just to keep on making mm-hmm. videos on the same thing. You, you, we can't do that, obviously. But but I tell you that that's one of them. Flying the uh, Falk Wolf with the Mustang, though, um, and that's not surprisingly. Cool, huh? The Mustang's totally faster, man. It is. 
yeah. is totally faster. But it's a Mustang, man. I mean, and in real life, it was faster, too. So, yeah. you know, there was a – it depended on the altitude, but anywhere from a 20 to 40-mile-per-hour difference at top speed. And I would say that difference in scale speed is pretty close to the difference in our models. I I appreciated it. It flies so good. And, um, you know, we, we went for 100% on, uh, high rate by the book. And I think you and I both, Jason, we, we briefly on via text uh, discussed that we both kind of increased our down elevator to flat mix, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I, I played with the CG a bit more yesterday and I adjusted my, my lower flat mix. I ended up with 10 and 20 is where I ended up netting out at, which is both more than what the manual had. Yes. Uh, and I think that's probably a better bet for most people because the last thing you want is your low wing airplane pitching the nose up, especially a warbird, yeah. uh, when you got your flaps down and your throttle off and it stalls unexpectedly. So, uh, yeah, a little more down elevator. And I do mention that in the flight talk video, which we'll be publishing in the next couple of days here. Got to do some editing because I want to put some grass takeoffs in with the pavement. Perfect. Uh, that thing's going to be great on grass. It is. It's it, it's easier on grass for sure. Tail draggers, it. they are. And, and you know, listen, I mean, I'm hitting some ground loops. And I, I don't know if you saw my runway, but that was a mess. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't feel my fingers, you know, but, but man, so the book calls out for an eight and 15 on the down mix. And I went, uh, by the end of it, 15 and 20, like, like mm -hmm. you said, so it, it's, it's good to see you on the same page. And I mean, really for me, uh, how how does the thing behave out of the power coming in on an approach? You know what I mean? Like once you remove the thrust, how's the plane settle? Right. And um, you know, with that mix, it seemed to settle really, really nice and predictable. And you were talking to me a little bit about like three pointers. And so that I definitely would have took me a while to come to <laughs> even interjecting that into my vocabulary, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with a uh tail dragger like that but i'm actually super looking forward to trying it because normally on a falk wolf i'm just gonna to really be moving and two wheel land it and then you know pin the tail if i can but it really takes more speed than i was able to let myself have um on those videos but did you play yeah, with that at all the three point is probably the best way to do it when you're flying, especially in calm conditions on a paved surface. Otherwise, if you do the wheel landing, it tends to, as it slows down and sets the tail down, you lose all rudder authority. And then by the time the tail touches down, you've slowed down enough and there's not that much weight and traction on the tail wheel that you just don't get a lot of steering authority. And so uh, the PD guys experimented with this a lot. They did um, the three-point landings. They did the wheel landings in wind, in calm conditions, on grass, on pavement. And in the end, which I'll talk about in the flight talk video, when it's not windy at all, you definitely want to try and shoot for the three-point landing, on pavement especially. On grass, it's really a wash. You can do either one. Uh, I like the wheel landings on grass. It just looks cool to me. Uh, but yes, yesterday there was a little bit of wind when I was flying earlier and it was beautiful. I could grease it, even wheel, wheelie landings, grease it no problem. But the minute nice. that four mile per hour wind went away and it was dead calm, uh, I tried the wheel landings and it came in again pretty smooth and everything was great and the tail was up and everything seemed, it just looked beautiful. And then as soon as the tail touched down, I had no authority. And so Dude. for that reason, yeah. you really should get the tail down to begin with. And that way, once the tail and the tail wheel are still more or less moving at a high enough speed to give you good control authority. Um, you know, you're at that point starting to slow down enough to where it doesn't end up doing a ground loop. So there, there's yeah. a learning curve. We'll put it that way. I, I, um, there were, I had a few that they, they present themselves as almost like what, what too slow looks like. And, and it mm -hmm. was probably a little bit of that too. The ones that, you know, my best stuff, my best landings were not landings like touch and goes. Mm -hmm. Like I would hit that, uh, I would touch down and, and I knew if I stuck with it, it would probably be ugly. And you can hear like the sudden application of throttle, but not like crazy throttle, but enough to keep the tail flying. And, and I'd have a nice, uh, ro you know, roll out and take off. I tell you one thing about this one though, uh, straight as an arrow for me, I, I thought mm -hmm. on, on takeoff and landing, you know, when you, you're adding that power in and you expect a real big, 
torque effect uh, to take over your steering. Um, it was really rock solid on, on the way it tracked down the runway until you're at the very end of your landing, like you say, if you were already kind of fighting the the thing. But I tell you what, with those landing gear, those are big, burly landing gear, super wide. Like, this is a good one to – I mean, I liken that stance to uh, – you know, P forty seven, but but ZZ Top got leg style. You yeah. know, <laughs> little little longer, but super burly. Yeah, really good looking plane, guys. Congratulations on that. And I love the, I love the telemetry on my NX six. Scrolling over, I flew five thousands and seven thousands. What's your favorite pack in that thing? I prefer 7,000 because I like the extra flight time. I'm flying to eight minutes uh, almost every time on a 7,000 and still landing with 20, 25% left in the battery. And uh, I do like the way it feels with the heavier battery in it. You know, many, many years ago, a lot of guys didn't believe me when I would bring this up constantly. Uh, we were converting airplanes to electric from gas or glow, and everybody was always trying to make them lighter. And I kept saying, I don't want it lighter. I want, I'm going to put extra batteries in it so it flies longer because I like the way it feels with the higher wing loading. It yep. settles in better. Yep. It just flies it just a bit more locked in, even without AS3X. Uh, but it also is more expensive. So I understand that uh, a lot of guys probably don't have 7,000s. 5,000s are great. Uh, five to well, seven minutes, no problem. And you can throw in dead ballast, or you can actually sometimes like increase your, your either down mix or maybe even start from a bit more of a down neutral elevator position to emulate what heavy might feel like. I agree with you 100%. My only complaint about the big foamies is always too light feeling. Like the, the 1,600-millimeter Spitfire, it's great. It doesn't feel heavy enough to me i ended up giving it some down mix make it a little more predictable on on the approach otherwise it's just just waller and it's, it's it's too light you have to make it either add weight to it or make it act like it's got some and then yeah. flying that spitfire versus the uh hobby king 1450 spitfire both success birds but because the little one is higher on the loading it's actually a little more honest feeling to me and like mm -hmm. the 1700 millimeter FMS jug from a way back, um, I I love P47s, but I didn't really like it. Yeah, it's but funny. I always have a good time on the 1.5 and the 1.2. So yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Like a little heft to these things really does feel more like what probably a, a wood one would have felt. Only truer to scale overall. Uh, I mean, a li to a degree. I mean, if, if it's a kite, it's just not going to fly on us. This thing was a hot it's, rod of the sky, man. Right. It had to have but that it also doesn't fly heavy, it. but it just feels more solid with the heavier battery in it. Yeah. 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 I thought it was very so, nimble. Loved years it. ago, I don't know if you flew any of these, but we had in our Hangar 9 brand, we had a lot of 60 size, what we called at the time scale ARFs. They're really more like mm, sports scale. They were scale, but they didn't have a lot of surface detail. And a lot of them, we kind of cheated the wing and, and the stabs to make it yeah. fly better. Uh, but the 60 size Mustangs we had back then were almost 11 pounds with a 6S power system. And, you know, wow. these foamies are like eight pounds. And so, you know, that's a big difference for a similar wing area. And uh, they don't fly light. Uh, but they also don't fly heavy. Those airplanes back then flew very, not very heavy, but flew pretty heavy. And I like a light airplane when it comes to something like the Carbon Z Cessna. I love that that feels really light. But that's a, I guess when I look at that airplane, I want to fly it a different way than I yeah. fly the Warbirds. I want my Warbird to fly like heavy metal, so to speak. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. And I mean, and if it's really nasty, windy, I'm going to, I'm going to load up something like a Cessna too. Just, just, it depends what I want to do. If, if mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, man, I'm just going to shoot some landings, play with some of this stuff. Like, let me get some good penetration up in it. But like, uh, yeah, I definitely want my Warbirds to, to, to fly solid. And, and yeah, not heavy. It's not like, I mean, even inverted, I, I was really surprised I didn't need a lot of down pressure 
uh, with that seven thousand. Yeah. And I and I always go a little bit nose heavy anyway, uh, especially early. And and um, I was really surprised it didn't take a whole lot of uh, down pressure. So uh, well, very well balanced uh, aircraft. Great follow up to the Mustang. Like mm-hmm. I, I hope guys are super excited. And you know, if you like the series, you you gotta support the series. Uh, not not to say get a Falk Wolf if you don't care for one. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're on the fence, let me push you off that fence uh-huh. and you can land on my link and make it happen. Cause it's <laughs> dynamite. Yeah. <laughs> Man, did you use any of the G2 packs in it? I didn't. Uh, and so for those that don't know the G2 packs and the G1 packs, they are the same cells. So performance should be identical, really, between the two. The big difference, of course, being the G2s have that beefed-up circuitry so they can balance faster, self-discharge faster, which eliminates the need for the balance connector as long as you're using a smart charger. Uh, And so I don't have any of those yet because they're just kind of getting into the warehouses and we're just starting to ship those out. Uh, But obviously, from now on, any batteries I buy will will be G2s because I like the idea of a battery that self-discharges even faster. The yeah. old, well, not the old, but the G1s, they take anywhere from a couple hours to almost a whole day to discharge, depending on the capacity of the battery. And these new G2s will do that in one third the time, which is a little better for the battery. Not a huge difference, but it is a nice uh, upgrade over the original. Um, and then down the road, I do believe we're going to expand the G2 line to have even more voltages or sorry cell counts and capacities than we had in the g1 line so in theory more and more applications should be able to use smart batteries you know a year or two from now as we continue to roll out that g2 line yeah no i uh not to make you feel bad but air marshal already has some g2 packs jason i know he got i can't even get him he's got them (laughs) <laughs> i i got some too man i like them I, i'm i'm gonna totally use them on my surface stuff too because it's it's nice not having the the uh the balance leads there i am gonna dive into the chat a little bit to get some questions yeah. for you jason yeah and um let's see i just saw one that was really good all right all right all right from aaron phillips um are the wheels on the falk wolf the same wheels on the p51 i would say with a definitive no, they are not. They, they are, are not. just as yep. rigid, but they are completely scaled out. Even the hubs have the cutout for the wh- where the stem would be to blow up the tire. I mean, yep. it's pretty tricked out. So, um, and, any- I, and I talk about this in the overview video, and admittedly, that video, it's like 23 minutes of me just blabbering. And so a lot of guys aren't going to watch that thing start to finish. I totally understand that, which is why on RC groups, when a person would ask a question that I answered in the video, I was sharing the uh, the link that takes them directly to that part of the video. And I made a comment, you know, oh, go nice. to this point to see this comment. The tire is one of the things that I talked about because we know a lot of guys uh, have talked about the P51 tires being too hard and then installing the Robart wheels and tires instead to soften things up, which on the Mustang actually works pretty well. Uh, on the And so going into the FW, I brought that up with everybody. They agreed, yeah, the softer tires on the Mustang worked better. Uh, but then when we looked at the FW, we thought, okay, softer tire, no problem. Well, the problem with the softer tire was it made the ground looping worse because on pavement in particular, once you set down, if you got any side load on that tire, it would just fold under and it would just skip and then it end up on the wingtip every time. In fact, it would do more damage than just having it barely nick the wingtip from a typical ground loop now with the harder tires. So out of the box, the FW comes with hard tires, but we do sell a set of separate softer tires if you want to install them. Are they the same tires with a softer yeah. wheel or are they just a replacement that'll fit? So it's just a replacement tire. You maintain your current hub, your wheel, and your bearing stay, and then you okay. just swap out the tire. So you still have the treaded pattern, the scale treaded pattern. I want that. It's just softer. Yep. I want to do it. I want to try it. Because um, yeah. my, my next question is, I you know, obviously if, if uh, you know, some folks will get into the spring of it all as well. And, um, man, I really am impressed by those retracts. That, that whole thing must be uh, just – shaft like it's that bo- that bottom pin 
part of the piston, you know, that attaches to the axle mm -hmm. must go nearly all the way uh, minus half inch. You can <laughs> tell by the travel on the on the strut. Yeah, you know, I haven't taken it apart and I haven't seen the CAD. You're probably right. It, it you can tell by the travel because you yeah. only get uh, three eighths. So that that it's got to be nearly all the way up in there. Because yep. you, once you got the spring that you can't compress past, so when that spring's compressed, it's probably, you know, three eighths or something. Very, very, very cool, man. I want to try those tires though. I, I did do the yes. Robart mod on the Mustang, but I haven't flown it yet. Um, I actually intentionally took that Mustang back out when we went to Winnemac to just own it on the landings because I wanted to redeem myself for my shakedowns yep. and stuff. Yep. And, uh, I, you know, had it worked out. I wanted to prove that it can be done. Um, so I will but, say a, but I a couple it. things. I saw somebody ask, do those tires fit the P51? They don't. But what Pilot Ryan just said is you can install a different set of Robart wheels and tires. Yeah. And those are, um, they've not discontinued. I think I saw you asking about that in a, in a recent video. They're just hard to get because we increased the demand so substantially that now everybody wants them <laughs> yeah. and they can't get them. What so, are they? Three and a half, three and a three quarter, or something? I think they're three and a half. I thought I had a set here, but I don't. So, um, yeah, if you go on to RC groups, you can see. Uh, and obviously, Chris Wolf did a great tutorial video on installing those. You have to shim the shaft. You have to, uh, you know, do a couple little things to get them installed oh, on the stock. Check um, this out, Jason. We did so. Pilot Jerry RC uh, was hearing me talk about the tires, and he he did a mod on the Robarts. Uh, with all the things you talked about. And then he, w I was like, dude, I'll pay you whatever. Do one for me. And then he did one, and it was so easy. He's like, Ryan, you just do it. And um, I actually did a live stream where this was – it may be in the title of the live stream. And you have to go to my channel and look at the live stream playlist to get at most of these yeah. because I don't leave them public. But you can get to them. But Pilot Jerry RC had this mod where he took the stock tire – I got the son of a guns. Anyway, took the stock hub uh, and tire, take the tire off. The hub just comes apart. Yep. So then put the robard over one of the sides of the hub and then pull, pull it down and roll it over a little bit. Mm -hmm. Epoxy those halves together. And so what you end up with is you get robard tires on the stock hub that's got bearings on both sides that fits perfect already. Totally Got it. awesome. That would, that would actually be easier, I think, than what you totally, have to do to shim it otherwise. Totally <laughs> awesome. And uh, I know I have those hubs sitting around. You know, well, I think I did see somebody mention that, and I didn't understand what they were talking about. But now that you've described it, I get it a lot better, and that makes a lot of sense. So I'll try that on a set for mine. I actually have a set of those wheels and tires, but I haven't installed yeah, them yet. It was so such I'll a slick that. mod. Like, I... I really was all about, uh, you know, blowing up Pilot Jerry for this because uh, it, was, it was super nice. And we did a live stream where I did my best to really show. I mean, I set up and did the thing. I had the epoxy. Um, you know, he was like, this will be a good mod to show your people. And I was like, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. And so uh, full credit to Pilot Jerry discovered that those robe hearts fit on these sons of guns, look super scale, have the bearings. And you got the Robart tires. That's what's on my Mustang now. And and that keeps you from having to have this. Which, yeah. which one would you choose if you could? Yep. Not only on looks, but the bearings. I mean, come yep. on. So, yeah, I cannot wait to try my Mustang with that mod done. So you epoxy these together because the tire will pop that apart if you don't. They key into each other, but there was nothing but the circ clip holding it together. Ah, uh, okay. But because of this son of a gun, as hard as a rock, it wasn't like it was going to compress and pop it off. Yeah. Ever. So, yeah, these are, you heard it, sound like I dropped a rock. <laughs> They're hard. They and are. we probably won't come out with a set of softer tires since that kind of mod exists and it's not that difficult. And yeah. so we'll let people do that on the P51. On the FW190, the tires are only $9.99. They're $10. Bucks. So Dude. it's a low-cost thing to try. They're pretty easy to peel off the old hubs and put on the new hubs. 
So a lot of guys will probably try it. Not everybody's going to like it. And you'll have to trust me, guys, that we've flown it both ways. And, uh, you know, <laughs> there's pluses and minuses to each tire, depending on the surface you fly from. And even maybe a little bit your style of landing. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm definitely into trying it. And and just like I did with the Mustang, I'm going to totally own it on the stock stuff first. Uh, because I like to show it can be done. Just like I like to take out that jet and put it in the new guy's hands. Because they were like, everybody's like, nah, no way. Nah, it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, no, it actually did. With, you with know, the, I took the Mustang the out yesterday with the FW, and I just, I really love that airplane. It flies so darn good. They both fly really darn good. But it's interesting you mentioned about the takeoff on the FW. What I noticed is on the Mustang, you can't punch the throttle and go. You can't do that. It'll end up going 90 degrees or 180 degrees the other way before you know it. And so on the Mustang, I was always rolling into my throttle and letting the, keeping the tail on the ground and then letting the tail come up and then flying off at about two-thirds throttle. Now, you can use that same technique on the FW, but after I did a couple touch and goes, I noticed on the FW, you can just punch it, and although it yaws a little bit, a couple degrees, it'll yeah, just go. And so I'd say it's a little better mannered in the takeoff than the P-51. Landing is not hard for either one. That's not the issue. Setting it down nice on the mains or even three-pointing the FW is not hard. The, where it gets difficult is making sure that you're ahead of the rudder once it's rolling out. That's where you get into trouble. And it's a little harder with the FW in that regard. But like everything, a little practice. I mean, I think yep. if you know which way it's going to go, you can be ahead of it. And yep. so because of that, would you suggest the guys flying off a of hard surface is probably be prepared to stay in 100% throw on the tail? Yes, I found that out the hard way. The first time I landed, I was in mid rates. And uh, as I was rolling out, I'm pulling full up elevator and I'm using the rudder. And no matter what, I gave everything opposite and it still spun the way that it was going. Yeah. And uh, somebody has that on video, I think. Hopefully they don't share it because it kind of caught me off guard. But I do say <laughs> in the video, I said, nope, I can't use mid rates for landing. I got to use high rates for takeoff and landing. Uh, but I will say on high rates, I like the way that it feels all around, yeah. but I did find the ailerons were a little hot for my liking and will probably be a little hot for some people's liking. But the big thing was on the elevator, if you're going full throttle, full speed, and you pull full up with a hundred percent elevator throw, it will snap. So I usually fly around at mid rate elevator and high rate aileron and then high rate rudder. And then on landing, I go back to high rate elevator as well for the rollout in particular. Nice. I did, uh, you know, I go by the book cause I, I, other, it, otherwise I'll answer a ton of questions. And yep. so it, it, it's, and I don't mind answering questions, but it's so easy when, uh, like can be on the same page, not, not like it's gold, but a good, a good reference point. And, and back to throw on the tail. I, I remember when I, back when I wasn't, hadn't been doing this very long, and, uh, you know, you, sometimes you think you're good, but you're not <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I was flying, the one of the FMS Mustangs off of grass a lot. And so off of grass, you haven't met Mr. Ground Loop yet. Nope. You have really, you have no idea. So but what I like to call my warbird rate, which is just like, if I had to guess and I wasn't doing social media and video, I would just probably default to about 70% every time on everything. And, and, and then, and see from there, but so, so warbird rate, low rate on my Dallas darling or whatever, and just owned it, uh, 70% throws. And then I took it to an event and I'm laying it on hard surface mm -hmm. and I could not get along. And so it was a couple day event. So that evening I, I, I put my throws on the tail up to a hundred percent, um, played with the differential probably made sure I had it both the same ways. You always have a mechanical advantage. It seems like on the rudder, if you're really nitpicking, you have more throw one way than the other, usually, unless you, you know, work it out. Just depends mechanical. on the geometry of the system. Yeah. yeah. A yeah. lot of times there's an advantage one way or the other and, um, dialed in a bunch of rate on the tail. And, and then the next day I was okay. I could, I could, I could deal, but that was, you know, that's how you learn. That's when you learn. So yep. I might even increase my throw a, a smidge on the tail and see what I can do. But only after 
I've exhausted uh, my my three pointer attempts. Yeah, try that next quota. Yeah, I'm gonna You'll try that. You'll be surprised that. at how high alpha ish you can come in um, and how soft you can touch down before it actually stalls. Uh, which of course your your goal is to get right there. And that yeah. way it touches down right at about stall. You know, imagine that stall warning's going off right as you're touching down. And then the nice thing is at that mm -hmm. speed, it usually won't ground loop. It just kind of rolls. It might skid a little to one side, but you're not going to end up spun around going the other direction. I love it. Um, I'm totally going to try it. I had a guy who was picking on me, uh, the Timber Brothers dad at, at the Muncie show. I had my E-Flight T6, which I completely... Oh modded out to a hardware i don't know if you ever saw it no i didn't uh, oh dude it's way back on my instagram you ought to see what i did to that e-flight texan um it's it's pretty good man if i don't say so myself i really tricked it out i grew up in the back seat of one so i i always ah. make it look like my grandpa's like every time there's a t6 like i do it um if it's worthy of it you know what i mean uh so that e-flight one was that's 57 inches or something yeah, I think so. It was 1.5 meter. It was 50, 58 inches or something. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And like 3S. Like, what? And then and it had washout the way it needs it and the tips because the T6 is a T6. So but it was so only they're, a foot long. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then that wing and where the gear are. And, you know, the T6 is a tube on top of a plank. So I, I feel like the planes that are configured like that are more prone to, to the loop than the ones that are settled in more like a zero and a Falk wolf, which seem to be in a P 47, which seem to just lock. But, uh, dudes giving me a hard time about I'm hitting, I'm, you know, T six kind of is tough. Oh, it's and tough. I, I made it four S I put Robarts on it. It's super dialed in. You got to check it out. But, um, I was hit, I was just doing two wheel landings, you know, um, and, and touch and goes and stuff. And the timber brothers, dad started giving me a hard time about three pointers. And uh, I was like, "All right, man." So I did some, and it was it's a it's really a lot of fun when you get it, and it is surprising um, to be able to, you know, get that angle of attack like that, you know, kind of alpha look because mm -hmm. you really seem to, in my mind, I think about that for for jets. That's the way I want to push a jet on in, you know, slow it down, nose up, push through, but. Um, that's how you got to, that's how they do it. If you watch the old training films, I mean, they'll show you. Uh, and it's funny with the T6 because everybody trained with it. So you'll have one, you know, faction training for wheel landings. And then you watch the Navy guys and it's always the three pointer. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. I actually have a playlist way back on the channel that I put together a load of uh, every time I ran into a World War II vintage training film. I would put it on this playlist. So like on my channel, there's a playlist, vintage training films or something. And I swear that's where I learned how to do everything. Now, when I'm flying a Model T6, the manifold pressure doesn't mean anything to me. But I, I totally learned how to do a bunch of maneuvers and stuff off of these, you know, snafu kind of World War II training films. And they're just totally bad to the bone anyway to watch whether or not you're flying that plane anyhow. It's just, a, I don't know a better time but yeah man uh i like that and i'm gonna totally try the the three-pointer and i hope i can share that with everybody uh my success yeah it was uh, a bit of a a surprise that first landing and the guys kind of had warned me they said that uh three points better and i'll admit i kind of just disregarded it and i thought ah whatever three points better that's gonna look kind of silly and then that first landing I did, it was a nice, beautiful wheel landing, center of the runway. And the next thing I know, the thing is turned 90 degrees. And I'm like, what just happened? So it is a, uh, it's not a, a difficult thing to learn. It does take practice. It does take a different technique. I think you yeah. need to be prepared for it. Yeah. I've had airplanes in the past that required extra effort on takeoff and on landing. And I just made sure I zoned myself into knowing these are the things that I've done to make it work better in the past. So on the FW190, I don't necessarily think you need to follow this technique for takeoff, but I used and I show the same technique for takeoff in the flight talk video that I use for the P51. The P51, you absolutely have to roll on the throttle slow. 
you got to have I on the P51. I literally have full up elevator and full right rudder as I start my takeoff roll. And then I start to relax both as it gets up to speed. Yep. I let the tail come up. And then if it starts veering one way or the other, I get it off the ground. Otherwise, yeah. I keep let it go straight and I'll fly, you know, more or less straight off the ground. The FW didn't really need that, but I do talk through that technique because I think that's a good technique to use for most warbirds. You yeah. don't need to take off at full throttle, guys, especially our airplanes because our model airplanes, because model airplanes usually have a power to weight ratio that's 50 percent or 100 percent better than the scale one had. And at two thirds right. throttle, the thing is probably flying at full throttle relative to scale speed for you know, the full scale. In fact, we did the math the other day. Um, Craig did it with me last, it was last night, I think, or yesterday. Yeah. And so he said that, uh, you know, scale speed on the FW190 at our size would be like 57 miles per hour. Oh. And that's probably what you're doing at about two thirds throttle on this yeah. thing. So, yeah. or even half. So, yeah, you don't need to take off at full throttle. But the nice thing is, after I did a couple touch and goes, and my dad, he probably noticed this, I was like, oh, I don't need to let this thing roll out and touch down and then, you know, slowly roll back on the throttle. As soon as those mains are on the ground, I can punch it and that thing goes straight off the runway again. So yeah. it is easier to manage in the P-51 in that regard. That's true. And, and and because of the power to weight, like, you know, I've, I've definitely had times where the Mustang wasn't going the way I wanted it to. And there's enough power there you get off anyway yep. if, if you're, you know. If yeah, and I think to. that's the reason so many people ask for more power. I think you have two camps. You've got the camp that wants to go fast. Fine. I get that. But then the other camp, and I see this more in guys that have learned to fly recently, they expect power to get them out of trouble. So if an airplane doesn't have a one-to-one -one or a one-and-a-half-to-one -one thrust to weight ratio, a perfect example is the Twin Otter. I got one sitting next to me because I'm going to go shoot some videos. I see so many complaints from people that say it doesn't have enough power on 3S. It should have been 4S. But uh, I can take off, humbug. pull right over into inverted, and go back down the runway inverted, right off a of takeoff. I mean, how much more power could you need? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's an interesting, I guess it's something we consider often. We always try to put in as much power and thrust and speed as practical. We aren't the kind of guys that, that say it's all going to be speed and we don't care about flight time. You know, our goal constantly is to hit a minimum of five minutes solid flying uh, with, you know, pretty normal throttle management, kind of what the average guy would do, a little bit of fast, a little bit of slow. If yeah. you get a little less than a full throttle, well, you know, that's your choice. But uh, I think these 60 size power systems are, are really, they're almost like 90 size power systems that we have in the P51 and FW. They work really good. They're really efficient. They're maybe not as fast as people would like them to be but they don't really need to be faster to enjoy them. I will say I was so glad that the Mustang was fast, faster than what we'd had before. Right? Yeah. In because that scale. Yeah. It was always a bit of a sacrilege that the 1450 Mustang had to have uh, a lot of guys were doing prop mods and stuff right away. Yeah. Um, it's a Mustang, man. It, it, it ought to be quick, you know? And, and The first time I saw one of those flying, I was driving up to a flying field, and I saw it. I was like, ooh, that's that new FMS Mustang. I can't wait to see this. And I get out of the car, and I'm watching him, and he's just doing circuits. And I'm like, oh, he's just flying around at, like, half throttle. And then I walk over, and I kind of look at his stick, and he's at full throttle. And I'm like, what? That's it? Yeah. <laughs> it was well, sacrilege. It was, And he was disappointed. He's like, man— yeah. I was super excited for this airplane, and all I feel like all I can do is just fly it around at full throttle doing, I don't know, 45 miles per hour, and just, I can't even loop from level flight is what he told me. Yeah. That, that was that was pretty much a bummer. The sure. irony is the oddballs would, would haul the mail. So their three-blader oh. stuff was just fast. Oh, yeah, right, right. Hawk Wolf, T-28, 109, zero, hauled butt. And and funny enough, I don't know why the the little fourteen hundred Corsair, same power system, uh, seemed so much faster than the Mustang, which which so, was kind of weird. Back in the day when we had the sixty size Warbirds from Hangar Nine that were all similar size, similar weight, we actually used the same airfoil on a lot of them. 
Uh, the fastest one of the bunch on the same prop, motor, battery, ESC, everything the same. The fastest was the P40, then the F, the uh, F4, then the Mustang. Huh. So it, it must have something to do with the aerodynamics. Now, granted, we're not talking one-to-one -one comparisons, sure. but um, I think that was a good relative. Like that, that opened my eyes to the fact that the Corsair inevitably is a cleaner airplane for some reason. Even our 1.2 meter is faster than the Mustang. With a very much similar Isn't that power. Crazy. Do you yeah. do you think it's the the is the prop biting more because it doesn't have the spinner? But you would think it be don't think negated so. by the yeah. um by the big old chunky front, you know? Yeah, the, I think the, it's just the round shape of the fuselage. It's clean all around. Uh, yeah. and then I think the the wing, for whatever reason, that shape seems to to work well. Uh, and so yeah, it just it, it Mustangs traditionally I think they should be fast. Uh, yeah. But they're not always the fastest. Our Mustang at the you know 1.5 meter scale scale speed would be about 60 something miles per hour, and we're doing about 80 in level flight, which isn't fast enough for some people. I think if it was 90 or 100, most people would be very happy. But at 80, it's faster than scale, so I think it it works well. Yeah, very very cool. I, I remember flying some of those Rock Hobby Racers, and mm -hmm. I, the Strega did win on those. Ah, okay. Um, but also, the thing that might be slowing down that Mustang was like really tucked up and and thin, thin profile. That scoop on the bottom is very much trimmed down on the yeah. Strega, um, and the tips too. Uh, very cool guys. Hey, uh, I don't know how many we got, but it looks like it's it's clipping along as a great show. Uh, thanks for everybody to come by. Um, do you guys have any questions for Jason? I want you to preface your question with a bunch of question marks so it's easy to not miss it. I see that everybody's talking to each other in the chat, and um, I love that. I did see a couple of questions about the NX radios. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is a hot topic. And I, you know, Robert. it's funny. I didn't even think about this until yesterday as I'm flying on the video with the NX8. I was thinking, oh, shoot, most people can't get these yet. And sure enough, I put the video out in this morning, and one of the comments is, hey, why do you have an NX-8 and I can't get one? So Because um, I work for Horizon, dude. <laughs> I feel bad. I don't want to say that, but yeah. It, yeah, you know, it's true. And so NX-8s are behind NX-10s. NX-10s are imminent, so they could be arriving as soon as next week. I don't know that we'll ship them out next week if they get here even by the end of the week. It'll probably be uh, more like the beginning of the following week so the last week of the month i think nx 10 should be uh going out to guys and then the nx 8s i think are just a couple weeks behind that that's fantastic i'm loving that nx 6 man and uh i'm i kind of want to do an nx 10 i i uh, may never go with my dx9 again um yeah it's pretty nice you know I, I some of you guys know if you follow close that i'm late to the party on messing with the uh off the shelf AS3X receivers. I've always touted uh, my love for that tech in the bind and flies, but also made it known that I never wanted to really get an app or a programming cable and mess with it. And I love that now. So I feel like this must be true for anybody who has the NX series or IX radios, that even if you screw up the bind, you can still just scroll into forward programming and do whatever you got to do. Yep. Which is is and I have a, a, a an asset very close in my back pocket most of the time that if I'm having any trouble with my spectrum stuff, you know, I I I like it so much I bought the company. Instead of watching Air Marshal's videos, I just call him on the phone. I'm like, dude, <laughs> hook me up. <laughs> yeah. And he gets me going on the knowledge, man, and 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 we 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 Knock it out really quick. So I've done a few of these setups now with the AR637T on my own with him. And, uh, man, I really like it. And I got to say, too, um, I think that – because I've been wanting to try out SAFE every time I, I get one of your new releases. And I, I uh, regrettably didn't always do that because um, you, you're like, well, I don't need SAFE. It's like, well, it's not about you, homie. You're making videos to show everybody how to do it. So so I've been doing SAFE. And uh, the bank limiting on the Falk Wolf, I think, is perfect. 
I think it's perfect. I put a yeah, AR- I think it was forty five, wasn't it? I think it is. Yeah. And I put an AR six three seven T in the FMS Corsair, and I think I went with just like it, if it if it has defaults already, I didn't change them, or I put in some kind of arbitrary uh, default for something else. I can't quite remember. Air Marshal might remember, but but I can I can tell when I flip safe on my Corsair that it's a very shallow bank limiting um point of reference which which makes it take forever to come around but the yeah, fault what a wolf, lot of guys man, don't still understand about safe is that we set the angle limit based on 100 percent travel so i tell this to my dad all the time i say dad if you're flying with safe on go to high rates otherwise you're not getting the full bank angle so if you've got a 45 yeah. degree bank angle at 100 percent travel if you set your low rates to 70, you then only get 70% of 45 degrees. So that's something ah. to keep in mind that a lot of people don't realize and don't even notice if they're flying the airplane. But if you're going to be in safe, I always go to high rates, always max it out to 100%, and then set your bank angle based on that. I like that. And I can tell Dave just had an epiphany. Dave, come on in here with us. Dave just had an epiphany. He, he just realized uh what you said there. yeah uh, yeah that made a light come on i was like get out of here because i was thinking at 70 percent throws it's still going to get to a 45 degree bank angle but then i started thinking about the math and the algorithms and all that sciencey stuff yep. and i was like it's angle oh, demand. angle demand at 70 percent is only going to give you yeah the light came on yep. it was a big one thanks man <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not a uh, very well known by everybody fact yet. It's something that we constantly remind people that you should be in high rates when you're in safe. And then maybe if you're not experienced and you flip out of that, then switch to low rates, which is a lot to remember. And that's why with the Ultrix, for example, in the manual, we actually recommended using your three position switch for AS3X and safe select and then using one of those AS3Xs as a low rate. So on that one, we actually tell people forward position is safe, uh, is hi- safe and high rates. We just mixed all the rates into the the gain switch in or into the flight mode switch, and then um, the second switch selection is uh, AS3X low rates, like seventy percent. Then the next switch position is AS3X high rates, hundred percent travel. Nice. Yep. And then I mentioned in the video uh, that I did, the overview video, that you know, with the forward programming and the transmitter now, like you said, Ryan, with the flight modes, you can go in and fix. If you didn't bind with safe select, you can turn it on. Also, something that you can do, which a lot of guys have been asking for for years, is they want to put on their three position flight mode switch, they want safe, AS3X, nothing. Now yeah. you can set up that third flight mode as nothing right through the forward programming. Yeah. So if you're an anti-gyro guy or you want to see what it's like to fly without a gyro, you can set it up in there and try it. Trust me, you're not going to like it, but <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. Yeah, I noticed that. And and I just left it. I mean, AS3X is so sick. I, 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 I have safe uh, one position and then AS3X on uh, the others. Um. Yeah, I like that. I'm learning, uh, which is, you know, it's funny. I, I feel like I had to teach everybody how to do Hobby Eagle and then um, the other receiver gyro thing. And, um, man, I like this stuff. I waited till all you beta testers got done getting it dialed <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, it has been a transitional time frame. And, you know, to be honest, I never really learned how to tune the last iteration very well because I knew this new stuff was coming. And I figured I might as well put all my time and effort into learning the new stuff, which I haven't done a lot of yet because I've been flying so many of our Binafly models. I still have a couple of ARFs on the bench and some PMP models that I've been wanting to change over to the new smart receivers. And so hopefully this flying season, I'll get more accustomed to programming from the start. And real quick note yeah. on that, uh, you know, the original P-51 AR-637TA receiver in the first couple airplanes we released last year that had those 637TAs, those were locked. Those receivers didn't allow you to change anything. You couldn't erase them. You couldn't adjust the gains. You couldn't adjust the flight modes. That has since changed to where now our new models come out of the box. So you have some flexibility. You can change the flight modes. You can adjust the gains through forward programming. 
If you have an older receiver that doesn't let you do that, you can update the software and then it will allow you to do that. Uh, and then you can also erase the settings to start over. Let's say you want to take the receiver out and put in another model. We now give you the option to do that. But if you do that, just know if you don't save the model file and settings that were in there, then if you erase them, you're never going to get them back. You'll have to start over again. So um, there's a video that uh, Tom did which explains this in more detail. Uh, I strongly recommend that you watch that if you're interested in either updating a previous version receiver or erasing it all together. Uh, but again, from here forward, the receivers have some of that flexibility now allowed out of the box. So the FW190, for example, you can go in and adjust the gains and the flight modes right from the transmitter. You can't get them too far out of whack, but you allow we allow some adjustment. That's probably good. Uh, like if, if you could, if you set parameters where it's, uh, you know, kind of do your best to idiot proof the, uh, the the settings. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, we don't want guys to erase it and then uh, not be able to fly it or or mess it up so bad, like they switch the direction and now the thing is you know fighting you instead of helping you. Uh, so we locked it down to that degree, which I think was a good compromise. I know some guys are like, give me everything. I don't want it locked down out of the box. I want it set, but I want to tune it whatever I want. Well, that's fine for an educated user, but a person who's new to it or doesn't know better, they'll go in there and they'll wreak havoc and crash their airplane because yeah. we gave them too much flexibility. Yeah. And I, and I think yeah, you I, see that all too often with people that buy like an AR637T and put it in their model. In like a plug and play model and uh, and they're still destroying models <laughs> the number one problem that i see and i come across it constantly and i even meet guys who have been flying for many years and have bought many of our models and have and are good pilots and they don't realize you should never take a receiver out of a bind and fly airplane and stick it in another plane and just check that the controls work the right directions and you're good to go no guys that's not enough if you ever move a receiver from one plane to another you got to reset it you have to start over. So, yeah, that's a common uh, common obstacle that a lot of people don't even know exists. And then they'll take off and they'll flip the safe and the thing does a figure nine. And they go, ah, safe is terrible. Spectrum is terrible. No, you didn't use it right. <laughs> that's, right. that's why I can't be in product support because that's what I'll tell them. <laughs> you didn't use it right. But, yeah. Yeah, to deliver you, the message. Air Marshals, my yeah. customer support division yeah, that, on Spectrum Electronics. It's easy to like shirk the people off onto somebody who's not a Horizon employee, and I can tell them <laughs> you didn't use it right. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. And it, it is. You know, it's. I hate to say that, but now when I go to the flying field and people know I work for Horizon, I got to remember that, and that's that's yeah. great. And I and I and I'm very fortunate, and I love helping guys in the field. But I can't say that, right? I can't say the problem is is not the product, it's you. <laughs> uh, when in reality, that probably is the case. I just have to be more careful in how I say it and show them. That's really the big thing that I found. If they come up to me and they say, hey, this isn't working right, I now ask them, do you have it? Can I look at it? Can I see it? Because nine times out of 10, just by seeing it in action or seeing it set up, I'm like, oh, here's the problem. And, you know, and then boom, the solution is there. They're ready to go and everything is working. Everybody's happy again. And I wish I could go to every field and help every guy in the world. I really, really do because there's a lot of misinformation out of there, a lot of misunderstanding. And a lot of that misunderstanding gets turned into blame for Spectrum, blame for Safe, blame for AS3X when it's not really founded in anything other than they just didn't know how to use it and didn't have it set up right. Yeah, and I, I'll tell you, I, I don't... <laughs> I don't know that that's a good idea going out to every field, you know, because I've <laughs> I've been to, to several events <laughs> now. And, and what I'll tell you is, I mean, I, I'm not world renowned, but I mean, some people know that I know a few things about Spectrum and I'll spend I go to these events to fly and I'll spend like 80 percent of my time helping people with their Spectrum problems, which is awesome. And I love doing it. Which is awesome. Um, you know, but like, I, I want to fly a plane too, dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So hey. the lesson I've learned about going even just to the field on a weekend with my dad out here in Las Vegas, uh, it's take my models ready. Don't go there with anything to work on because I'm not going to have a chance to work on it. Charge, charge all my batteries before I go. Show up, unload, 
get a couple of flights in and know there's probably going to be a one or two hour break in there where I'm helping guys. And I love that. That's no problem. The other thing that I've learned is like I had the FW90 with me on Sunday. So this past Sunday before it was out in the public and I left it in the car until most guys were um, you know, getting ready to go. And I'd already flown all my other stuff because, of course, the minute I pulled it out, that's all everybody wanted to talk about. And then it turned into, oh, hey, can we watch your first flight? Hey, can we film your first flight? <laughs> Which is fine. Uh, it didn't go yeah. quite as well. I mean, the flight was great. That wasn't an issue. The only thing that caught me off guard was the landing. I did the wheel landing, and I, I got a little bit of a ground loop, and I go, oh, I should be on high rates. <laughs> <laughs> we have, even in the when it's nice out, uh, most of the guys at our field could give two rips. What? About, yeah. About, they leave about, you alone? Yeah, they leave us alone, oh. man, because the, they're gas dudes. They don't care at all. Um, oh. There's a couple guys that do, and they're, like, close to us. And and I still tell them, even though they know, uh, I still tell them uh, every time you, you can't say anything. You know, you can't say anything. This will be coming out Thursday. Um, so you're e fortunate that they're not like uh, big social media RC groups guys that can't wait to share the new thing. Um, totally. Yeah, that's something I have to be considerate skunk, of when I'm out in public. Skunk like, works, man. Yeah, it's I've got a couple always of, been that way. If I, if I turned my computer like 15 degrees to the right, the world would explode into flames. Oh, <laughs> man, I can't wait. I can't. I can't take it out into public. I got. I have to literally drive. We're going to drive to the middle of nowhere to fly this thing. Sick. <laughs> Because we got to get some video footage of it, and I can't risk anybody seeing it. So, yeah, so that leads us to you know, I mean, not that we're spoiled rotten brats who are already talking about the next release, but we kind of are. So, yeah. um, <laughs> get a Falk Wolf, guys. Watch my video; it's awesome. Watch Jason's video. I think me and the sailors were maybe the only influencers that had them this time. Yep. So tell me in the comment section below. Who's cuter? I don't know, but but watch the video, guys. And then I got more coming out, and I flew it in. Uh, if I put it in safe, I'd let you know. There was a time in one of yeah. the videos I can't remember which one because I you guys seem to really resonate well with the shakedowns, but I got to tell you, just kind of nerdy stuff on YouTube. Like when I release two or three or four videos on Thursday at once, um, yeah. YouTube basically penalizes you. In a way, you yep. suffer. So yep. it's like, you know what, man? I'm doing the work. I, I want to get the most out of the algorithm on YouTube. So we're going to wait a few days for the shakedown. But in the shakedown, I, I did check out what SAFE was doing. And I just think it's totally wild to be upside down and flip a switch and it gently come back around the level. I think that's cool. And, yeah, you had and the gear get, down. I think it was you, you took off. Uh, you might have been landing in safe and you took off and then, yeah, you yeah. rolled it inverted. You're like, let's flip safe on. And I'm like, oh, God, don't do that. And it just kind of rolled out. I was like, oh, no big deal. <laughs> it worked even I, better than I thought. <laughs> yeah, I do it all the time, man. It's it's because I don't, you know, because I don't mess around with a camera on my belly trying to get the radio. And, and so it's the best way for me to show, you know, if you listen to the click, you you hear the switch click and then the thing yeah. rolls over and, and, you know, everybody believes me too. I mean, I mean, who's faking this stuff, but, uh, yeah, it's neat to show what safe can do. And then I like to show kind of how, how much it takes to come around. And I was really impressed with the, the way that was tuned because so, well, so was I, <laughs> my biggest complaint on, um, it's not a complaint. It's just a thing like, if I'm flying safe on some of the other stuff, especially maybe the more geared toward beginner things, the, the bank limit is really shallow. So I'm trying to make a video, man. I got, you know, time. Like, I don't, I don't want to spend that long coming around. So I will want to show what safe is like, but I really only will flip it in to show it flip over or recover or on the landing because the turns take too darn long for me. So with the Falk Wolf, man, you could really tighten it up, and and I thought that was I thought that was neat. But I'll have to double check if I recall correctly on the Falk Wolf when I had it on the bench was safe on, and I moved the ailerons. I think it kicks in a little bit of rudder, which is something that you know our engineers they're learning wow. this as they go. And the reason yeah. I was so impressed with the way the Falk Wolf rolled out 
is see there's certain settings we don't let you guys adjust as the uh, end user you know we let you adjust now safe which we didn't let you do before in as3x gains but the um for example how fast it snaps back to level uh that's something that we tune and that's yeah. why i was really impressed on that fw i thought you were inverted i thought the thing was going to whip or even pitch and it didn't oh. it just rolled out nice and smooth nice and yep purple. and they tuned that intentionally but then in, in addition to that now we're learning put more rudder in yeah. because you can get that you bring the nose around faster and that's why they're turning tighter even with lesser bank angle now you know i was telling bobby uh also i was like you know what i think they because i was noticing how well behaved it was on the ground and I was like, man, I, I wonder if they jacked up the rudder on this thing uh, on, on the AS3X because it, it, was, it was definitely a lot easier. I need to bind up my – I like testing these theories when I come up with them in my head. I, I'm going to bind up my uh, Mustang for safe and see what it does. Ha, has anybody noticed a significant change uh, if you were taking off the Mustang in safe, let's say, versus just regular AS3X? Does it help? keep the yaw in check or not a lot yeah i did no. try it i did try it so the problem there is the the aerodynamics so the rudder is not up to airspeed enough to work and so safe is trying but it can't do anything because there's not enough airflow across it by the time the airflow gets across the rudder and fin to make it work well you're already in the air yeah. so safe doesn't actually help a ton on uh you know tail dragger warbirds in particular uh it it, by the time it gets up to enough speed, you already are going to be in the air, so you might as well just have taken off without safe on to begin with. Or it doesn't matter, take off with or without safe. Either way, you're going to end up in the air at about the same point, and everything leading up to that is all you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. it, it, so, it so it is just the difference in the, in the planes themselves. So yeah. I know you can't tell us. Everybody wants to know. How crazy a stretch is the next 1.5 going to be? Is it going to be something that seems to, you know, be kind of a safe logic bet, or 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 do you do, do you think there might be a, a opportunity to go uh, a little bit different? Is it time for a navy one? Uh, what about the other classics? You know what I mean? Jugs yeah. and spits and so the. The short list is a lot of your top choices that everybody has. Um, slightly outside of the top few are some of the more obscure but still pretty well known. Uh, and those ones will never make it to the top of the list unless the FW does well because the FW was on the top of that list. So, okay. uh, yeah, that's why, like you said earlier, if you don't like the FW, don't buy it, of course. If you're on the fence, get off the fence and buy it, especially if you're interested in seeing more models like it. Things that are a little off the beaten yeah. path, not a lot. Guys, we're not doing anything crazy. We're not going to be doing any, you know, Italian warbirds. We're not going to be doing any. Uh, <laughs> no you know, mockies. We're never going to no do Bugattis. a Stuka. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. We're never going to do a Stuka. Although <laughs> today we were talking about some, we're doing some project planning for a couple of years from now already. And I said, there better not be a Stuka on that list. And Steve goes, you know, I didn't even take the time. I didn't even waste the time to type it just to be funny. So <laughs> Stuka is never going to happen. Um, as far as the Navy stuff, man, it, you know, it always is at, it's always on the list. And every time we look at Allied versus Axis, it always, the Navy stuff ends up further down the list from your typical P 47. Yeah. Even Spitfire is yeah, always the, ahead the of Navy that. The Navy was far more prevalent it's, in the Pacific theater. Yeah, it's tough for us to try. I, we want to try one. We really do. We've always talked about uh, maybe doing something like the, um, the Dauntless, you know, just something that's Man. really kind of mean, but probably will fly well. Yeah. And I think that would be a good choice. Uh, Sky Raider comes up a lot, which I personally do not like, but it they don't know, they they don't thing. do anything for me on looks. But the, I, to everyone, every time I've seen one fly, it looks like it flies so good. They do. Uh, they um, do. But on looks, they don't get me. But flying them can change my mind. I mean, an F twenty two never got me on looks either. But man, I gotta, flies I kind of want to. I want to always have one, yeah. F-22 um, is not sexy. And even the F-35 is not sexy, but nope. they both fly in a special way. So, That's right. Yeah, I wish we had those myself. <laughs> so does the fact that 
FMS, for instance, sells obviously a P40, uh, a big Corsair. Um, do those things come into play when you guys are considering what to kind of go for next, or or it, are it you does. just like, does it? It, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, you know what it I does gotta, because. They, it already exists, and yeah. obviously we look at competitors beyond them as well. And if there's something like, for example, if there's a 1.6 meter Spitfire, guys, you're never going to see a 1.5 meter Spitfire from us. It, if it's done well, there's no reason for us to do something around the same. We might as well spend the time, the money, the effort. We only get a finite number of new products per year. We might as well not waste that on something you can already get or get from someone else. I'm glad you, can you buy said a that. Flightline Spitfire and put a Spectrum receiver in it, yep. and you're good to go. I'm uh, so glad so, you said that because yeah. so many times I remember guys being annoyed. There was a time where it was like Flightline would put one out, Freeman would put one out, and then you'd see the FMS one. And yeah. and not only was it the same subject, but it's like the same size. It's like, come on, man! I'd yeah. rather just have something different. So. I'm I'm glad to hear that from you on on philosophy, um, so so that does put some more options kind of on the plate then. So you you can immediately write off stuff like Spitfire, Corsair, and, and Corsair. I want to pick on the Corsair a little bit because <laughs> yeah, I love it. By the way, and thank you so much too. for letting me work it and uh, everything you do for us over on this channel because it's not about me; it's about everybody we get to share this with. And maybe just a little bit me, but you know, <laughs> so the Corsair, this is the sec. they call it a version three version one, 300 KV motor wasn't enough. So I think version two, they did a 360 KV. It was actually powerful enough. It was blowing the face off of the Corsairs all the time. So they had to come up with like a way to reinforce the back of the hub. Okay, cool. So that's like version two town. And then they really, truly did, like, go back into the molds, fix the battery hatch, do a lot of big changes. And I and I know it's true because um, I, I was around the V2 working uh, the booth at Oshkosh with motion, and I, I couldn't get keep my eyes off of it. So I, I definitely know with the old 301, everybody had the 301, whether it was 800 millimeter, 1100 millimeter, whatever, it's always the 301. Uh so this one is definitely different. So like kudos on all that re-engineering that goes into that. But then, <sighs> what the heck? Here we are with the 300 kV motor yeah. that's got the the back plate reinforcement. Everything's the way it ought to be to to pep this up and have it go right out of the box. And and as you know, uh, it was fairly. Scale is another a nice way of saying anemic. <laughs> Boring. It probably uh, was yeah. close to scale speed, yeah. <laughs> and and then I did put on the, you know, I did a video just the other day, this week, I believe. In fact, I put out, I flew it the same day as Falk Wolf, to be honest with you. After the work was done, that's why I got the sunset on the Corsair video. Uh, the new prop. And it did wake it up, and I could tell right away. But if you look at the comment sections... There's the market speaking to us, and it's yep. it 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 says some gun still needs to be faster. So, um, what would you do? Fly it if, closer if, to your face. That's yeah, that's what I always say. <laughs> but like, you know what, Jason? I actually bought an ESC because I was going to try to go 8s, and I bought an ESC that was for 6s, like a fool. Yeah. Um, I want to try 8S on that bird. Is that just what, what has to happen on that bird to go fast? I or did they so. kind of think, miss the boat? I think a different uh, KV motor and a different prop diameter and pitch could have been a good combination on 6S. But honestly, you wouldn't have got great flight time on a 6S 5000. Maybe a 7000 would have been okay. When you're that big of a model, that really needs to probably be an 8S setup. It and probably just has to be. To speak to your earlier point point a model that big also is going to feel better if it's got a bigger system in it another battery yep. or a big honking motor on it yep. because that was my only complaint out of the big p47 1700 was man the son of a gun ain't heavy enough like i don't know if i'm going to just paint it or just i don't know what i can't get it to to act the way my my other smaller ones heavier on the loading ones act yeah but but i love that corsair it is cool 
Um, and so as far as the horizon, you know, map of the future, you can easily ride off. And I'm, I'm sad to say, I would love to see y'all do a P40, honestly. And I'd love to see y'all's version of a Spitfire. Uh, but, man, my phone is blowing up. I must be an influencer who's doing well or that's, something. That's live so, right now and people want to, like, correct you on the fly. <laughs> yeah, like, talk to me, like, right now, asking me a question. Yeah, dude, uh, wheel pants. So we're not going to see a Corsair. We're not going to see a Spitfire, probably. Uh, not going to see a P40. So we got some oddballs that could happen, which is which is kind of right. promising. Would you – now, I, I you notice I didn't even mention the P47 because I really hope it's not true. I would love to see yeah, you do your I was thing. I going to say, can we spitball some names out there and you can give us hard nose man. or just nothing? Uh, <laughs> give us a yeah, – give the, man a P47 jug, dude. The P47 is – obviously it's been done uh, by – they have a 1450 yeah. and it's pretty good. Uh, yeah. In some ways, you know, and there's some ways that that maybe by today's standards, it's not up to snuff. And if we redid it and I like the three piece wing is a big deal to me. I love having awesome. that center section with the gear in it. Easy to put in and out of the car, easy to snap the wing panels on. I would love to give that treatment to every airplane in that size. Uh, and so that alone is a bit of a, a bigger point of difference to where, yeah, maybe the P-47 makes some sense. But, you know, we've done a lot of P-47s over the years. And yeah. I think we have an internal appetite to try something a little bit more off the beaten path without going crazy. Uh, so I would say it's a maybe, but uh, a not likely. What yeah, about I, it, uh, like the Grumman cats, you know, your Hellcats, yeah, Wildcats, uh, Bearcats? You know, That's at the top be great. of the Navy list. The Corsair, of course, would be, but there's already Corsair, so the next ones up are exactly those. The catch is, would a an allied fighter from the European theater or even an Axis fighter from the European theater do better than one of those? Our um, data, our gut kind of says yes, but then you we're running out of options because a lot of these other ones have been done from that yeah. theater. So. so Something I, I think would be interesting, though, is seeing something like a, a, you know, and I can't remember if it was the Hellcat, uh, but like the first Blue Angels uh, and actually doing a Blue Angel scheme in one of the, the like the first Warbirds uh, could be pretty cool. Yeah, I'll have to go back and look at what they started with. I forget what it was, but was um, it a Bearcat or a Hellcat? I think it, it might have been a Hellcat. Two, yeah. yeah, one of those. Um one of those. So, so to beat the dead horse, I, I the P forty seven is pretty good, but I would love to see y'all do your one point five thing to it, just to give it a little more heft, give yeah. it a uh, get rid of that dang Bonnie paint scheme. <laughs> I can't stand it. That's why I painted mine red tail. Yeah. And um. Uh yeah, I love y'all's touch on it because, I mean, think about the fourteen fifty FMS versus the one point five. Um, even though some folks were acting like they're very similar, they're really different classes of plane. So yes, the one point five is already six s, but uh, it, i I really love, I think most guys who really pay attention to the hobby should appreciate um, what happens when horizon gets together with FMS when when not of course, not all your e flight stuff is made at their factory. But right. when y'all's head get with their manufacturing, I think we all get some really bad to the bone uh, products, and and I appreciate that. So, um, so you're saying European theater is what it sounds like? B twenty five. Someone's gonna do it. Are you Man. gonna be the first one to the table? Yeah, it's 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 at the top of the list. So what we what we've been doing the last couple of years it's gotta is. Be big -ish. You know, years and years ago, one of my frustrations personally was that I had all these kinds of crazy sizes of batteries. I had 5S batteries for this and 3S 2700s for that. And I just got so many batteries. I said, you know what? Personally, I'm done. If it's not a 3S or 4S 2200, a 3S or 4S 3200, or a 6S 5000, if I can't use a combination of those batteries in it, I'm not buying it. So that way I just have a box load of 6S 5000s and a bunch of 2200s and 3200s in different capacity or different cell counts and I build 
3S, 4S, 6S, 8S, 10S, 12S setups out of those. And so we've been taking that approach kind of in our product development now. You'll nice. notice that more and more of our airplanes are exactly those sizes of batteries. We're not doing the weird one-offs like we have more in the past. We're trying to settle in on uh, there really is no reason for 5S. Like we're never going to make a 5S airplane. Right. We may make an airplane that works on 5S. <laughs> Probably by accident. <laughs> but 5S is so a non-event. In fact, you know, I got that Husky 5S. It was how it was originally touted to us. Oh. And and uh, I did that second. So there's two versions of the Husky from Arrows. And the second one I just released the other day. And, and they were telling me 5S. And I was like, yeah, no. I'm going to do this video on 4S <laughs> and 6S. Because who's got them? You know? Who, I've never you know, even fun, seen a 5S I can tell you a battery. fun history lesson on uh, 5S and 6S and how that all went down about almost 15 years ago now. It's a fun story. Do it. But anyway, yeah. Too long for the show? <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. And a lot of guys, if you haven't been in the hobby for a long time and you haven't done helis and airplanes, you won't. It'll, a lot of it will be lost on people. But in the end... It's 6S became what 5S used to be, and now I'm sorry, 5S, It's there's just no reason for it. <laughs> for real. Uh, for um, real. I, I agree. So, yeah. um, nice. We're going to wrap it up in about you know a little bit here. Uh, man, well, Jason. 25 is, is a great idea. We love that. I mean, I would love to do a, a, a B-17. I would love to do a lot of these models around a 6S-5000. And that's how we ended up at 1.5 meter. We wanted, we had a couple of criteria. Number one was we felt like $500 was the ceiling, $499 yeah. and below. Yeah. We wanted a plane that was as big as possible to get to that price that had excellent performance on 6S. And when I say excellent, I don't mean, you know, like the 1700 Corsair, which is yeah, okay for some people and not enough for most, uh, or the 1.5 meters, which were okay on 4S. You put a 6S, they maybe are getting a little heavy now. So that's why we, how we ended up at 1500. Uh, it's a sweet spot to me, and I think uh, people yeah. are starting to realize that. It's big enough to feel big, small enough to be easy to transport, and to get really good performance on a 6S 5000, which is also why on the EDF side, we feel like 80 millimeter is the sweet spot compared to, say, your yeah. uh, you know 90 millimeter or twin 64 millimeter is your sweet spot compared to, say, twin 70s, because you can get away with that one 6S, 4,000 to 5,000 battery, good flight time, yep. good size, good price. I think those are the sweet spots for us. I think you're hit, You're hitting it. I think all that sounds uh, sound. And, and the 1.5, I think, is a great Warbird size uh, for 6S because they still have that presence. They still feel like they're substantial, not getting beat around. Um, mm -hmm. by the wind too much. They're going to penetrate. Uh, yeah, very cool. Um, I want huh. one of these 5S, or sorry, I mean 1500 6S P39, but I got to say, Ooh. guys, this thing flies awesome. Everybody that has one loves it. I, every time yeah. I fly it, I sell a couple, but it still is not doing well. What, the P39? Not selling well. Hmm. Yeah. It's too bad because it is a really nice 1.2, man. It is. It's fast. It's slow. Unique. It's easy to ground handle. It looks like a fighter with the gear up. I mean, it, but it's just a little too far off the beaten path. And we tried, guys. We tried the AT6. We tried that. And, um, you know, they, they didn't do great, unfortunately. I feel like the P39 flies like a Spitfire mixed with a P40 mixed with a Mustang. Yep. It, it's like all the best of those right there. And that I, almost I just lands like a T28. Right. Um, and, and I was remembering what I was going to say. Um, when I, I've said this a couple times probably. When I was building the first uh, 1.5 Mustang, I'm like, ah, uh, these outer panels, what the heck? You know what I mean? I'll never use yeah. that. Yep. Uh, I'll just leave it put together. And I got to tell you, every stinking time <laughs> I go to the field with these planes, those panels are off. Yep. Because to transport on the wheels or on a stand like that is too cool. I want to applaud you and your team for, for noticing uh, opportunities with the Falk Wolf to improve on what was already just bad to the bone uh, Mustang. I, I, I think when guys see the, 
builds that'll come out. I've got some footage I still got to go through. Guys, I turned this over quick. I got it Friday yeah. night. We built it Friday night. We flew it Saturday. Edit, put together, live your life, work your job. Here we are Thursday night. I got a couple videos in the bag. So I still need to put together my assembly. But yeah, kudos, congratulations. I hope you guys will check out this Falk Wolf. Uh, even if it's just to get primed up and excited to see where the heads at Horizons are at. Because yep. they're with us. Uh, it's so nice when you you get with a company that's that really knows what they're selling, cares about what they're selling, and and uses what they're selling. Sometimes I work with companies that don't know what they got. Um, it, it, it's nice when somebody really knows uh, what they've got. They listen to the community and they take opportunities on the next ones to make these really really nice improvements. And and you're going to see some of that in assemblies moving forward. Uh, and hopefully on the 1.5 series moving forward. Again, plastic to plastic where the uh, wings go together outboard is really cool. I love what you did with the external tank. The fan, that BMW engine, you know, it's got the fan on it. Isn't that a BMW engine on a real one? They always had that that cooling fan. They did. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think they are. Yeah. The FW190s were BMWs. Totally cool. And and you could stick your hand through there if that, that spinner's off. And, and, you know, adjust the battery. I mean, I love the airflow in there. Just good plane. I love the plastic bits all around the battery hatch and on the battery hatch itself. So you, you can't – I mean, this thing is really, really nice, guys. So uh, if you're not into a Falk Wolf, check it out anyway because you can see what's going to probably be implemented in future offerings. Uh, stay on these guys like stink on it. Let's get a B25 out of them. I think it would be dynamite. <laughs> Uh, yeah. what size does it have to be? If you uh, guys are doing multis, it'd probably be right around 1.5 to 1.6, I'm guessing. But yeah. any um, smaller is ridiculous. Yeah, that's the problem is we don't really like the idea now of doing warbirds that aren't extra scale. And when we say extra scale, that's what the P51 and, and Falk Wolf are to us or the SU-30 or the F-18, things that have all the the scale bits and pieces that you have to leave off a 1.2 meter models or 70 yeah. millimeter edfs uh we do need those in our lineup and we'll still always make models like that yeah but if 1. we're going to do a B25, is awesome. we're not we're not going to do a b25 with solid windows and flies <laughs> on a 3s 2200 <laughs> that's that's not a B25 if you want to like us. create anarchy in the rc market do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I we'd probably people... sell some, but we'd be kind of bummed out. Like, I wouldn't be super proud to pull that out of my car and fly it at a big event because it's just not special. We want some of these models, especially – I think the way the market has gone is we saw this massive, massive spike in demand for Warbirds five, six years ago. And then uh, what happened is it, it all got very saturated with the typical 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 meter, a bunch of those over and over and over and over. And then EDFs came out and everybody went over there. Not everybody. A lot of people went over there. I yeah. don't think Warbirds died, but they slowed down a lot. And for me personally, I got bored with them because they weren't extra scale. Yeah. I wanted more. I wanted more scale details. I wanted more functional features. All the guys in the office felt the same way. That's why we did the Mustang. So we could have all those cool features, have the three-piece wing so it's easy to transport and, and store. Uh, and I'm with you. I, when I first got it, I was like, I don't know if I'll ever take these panels off. And every time I don't, I kick myself because it's so easy. And even though they're yeah. only like, you know, a meter span, right. they are not even, they're like, what is there? They're like, <laughs> it's like a foot or so. A foot, got, yeah. But it's so convenient. Well, I, you take it off and it's so I think convenient. you mentioned it in your video too. I think where your your engineers and, and surely yeah. somebody had figured this out is that when you take it off, that main wing section that's left attached to the fuselage is like the same width as the horizontals. So yep. if you yeah. can fit it with the horizontals on, you can fit it with the wing panels off. Yeah, I mean And exactly. what else can you fit in the car when you when you do more that. airplanes yeah so and now you can easily take two 1.5 meter warbirds in a trunk of a car whereas before you there's absolutely no right, way right yep this whole bit guys except for the edge of the aileron the itself oh, this the whole yeah. 
Oh, that, that whole that whole face there is all plastic now. Yeah, the and it's recessed to receive the other one oh, too. That's nice. Yeah, that's better than the Mustang, man. <laughs> it it's a little yeah, bit like is. the way the A10 wing fits in. It's See, uh, now area you got to do a well. Mustang V2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of those changes are not practical for modifying the molds. Right, right. Uh, so we, we're probably so. Won't. Yeah, no, Dave. <laughs> So here's a question. Uh, I saw Dennis Farley, who welcome to the party on 6S airplanes. Dennis Farley has been chomping at the bit. He's been holding out forever. And when this one point, I knew he was going to do this. Even before it was announced, I just like, I bet Dennis pops. I bet Dennis goes Ooh. 6S on this release. And uh, he pulled the trigger today on that crazy order button um, on the Falk Wolf. But his question was, when, not what? But when could we expect to maybe see a 1.5, uh, the next one? Because guys are hot on these series. Yeah, man. yeah. I was going to ask you myself, is it, is it kind of safe to say that the 1.5 Warbird space, is, I mean, you guys kind of own it right now. Uh, are, are you guys going to keep moving well, forward with it? The uh, Mustang came out a year ago, and we started the FW about mm, – seven or eight months into the p51 cycle so that's how it was relatively quick to come out a year later not a whole 18 or 24 months later and so uh you know at, at a minimum we're probably looking at a year from now it wouldn't happen probably within the year um and i can't say obviously what we're working on but it is something that has been at the top of our list as a potential category to build out so we've been talking about other subject matters and, and another potential project in that space for a long time. Um, and, but I can't say whether or not we've started something or when exactly. But I will say nothing like the Fock Wolf or Mustang is coming out within the rest of the year. Okay. Fair enough. So get it, dudes. Get if it you're now. into the 1.5 series, you know what your options are. Uh, yeah. We got a we got a, a, a aggressor and a you know we got the protagonist and the antagonist. You got the Mustang and the Falk Wolf, and uh, whoever's got the Mustang already. Here's a little tip, a little hint. You're you're gonna be faster than your buddy, but but not yeah. by much. Yeah, and I noticed on uh, both airplanes, not a lot of airplanes do I see a big difference in speed between a 30C, a 50C, and a 100C 6S 5000 pack. But on those models. Uh, both the 6S 5000 50C and 100C and then the 7030C, I do notice a couple miles per hour more. So I haven't actually clocked it on all those batteries, but I do feel like the 30C works. It gets the job done, no problem. But if you want a, a little edge in performance, go with a little bit better battery if you're buying new packs. Uh, 30C is fine, but you just get a couple more miles per hour, I think a little bit more thrust out of yeah. those higher C and higher capacity batteries. Hey, so... I think I've noticed some of that too. It, it, you do get a little more punch on those high C packs. I saw I saw a couple of questions that uh, you know before before we have to cut it off. Um, you know that have no doubt scrolled by by now, but there's stuff that Jason can answer because they're directed towards like very right now promotions. Um, one of yes. them is uh, is the battery that comes with the combo for the FW190. So if you guys didn't know. There is a combo for the FW190 uh, that comes with a smart pack right now. So uh, does that combo come with a G1 or a G2 smart pack? And what size is the smart pack that it comes with? Yeah, so it comes with the 6S 5030C Gen 1. Awesome. Perfect. So the reason for that is because we don't have enough stock of the Gen 2s yet to be able to supply enough for the combos we're gonna sell. And I can tell you today, um, you know, when I looked earlier about half of the pre-orders for the bind and fly were the combo version. So that it's means a good it's deal, right? It's well. an awesome deal. Uh, and yeah, it's, I think it's a, it's well, it's a well-liked combo because you're only, you're basically the way I look at it is you're paying $50 for a name brand, good quality 6s 5000 yeah, normally that battery is if like 110 put, bucks if we put that on our website we would sell like a thousand of them in a day <laughs> <laughs> yeah. dennis totally got the combo dude ah uh, good yeah that was the point of that for a guy who doesn't have the battery or a guy who's been wanting an excuse to try a smart battery 
that's what that combo is for. And that's why it's only available for pre-orders. We're not going to sell it after the airplane starts shipping. So on uh, February 5th, that'll be the last day you can order that. And that's if we have enough supply. If we run out of batteries for pre-orders between now and then, we're going to turn it off sooner. So if you want a combo, order it right away. Pre-order it right away to make sure you get one. Right. Through pilotrymedia.com is what he just said so there. So for, the, yeah, for um, the folks that are asking how much is the combo, the combo is 50 bucks more than the plane. So I think it's selling for like 549 yeah. Yep. And yep. Some change. Yep. Exactly. So you're getting sixty bucks off the battery because it's normally a hundred nine dollars by itself, and that is. But again, I look at it as fifty dollars more for a good six S five thousand. You can't That's go wrong cool. with that. Even if you already have plenty of batteries, come on. Just yeah, buy it. and Jason. <laughs> yeah, you save. You save fifty it's bucks. Fifty bucks on a for a smart pack. Yeah, I mean, it's a hundred nine dollars six S pack. Why would you not? It's, That's while what we're I still say. In that I don't know why anybody's window. ordering without. It's silly. It's yeah, silly. Yeah. So one question is. So we kind of have an idea of maybe when 1.5 is down the road, at least a year seems. Um, but in general, uh, just next release, are we talking a couple months, a couple weeks? Um, what's going on? I got For me, I got nothing else in the queue at the moment from you. I do want to tell everybody um, those vapors are amazing fun time. <laughs> yep. Uh, and I'll have videos on that coming soon. But uh, – we had a great time flying them during the stream last Saturday. And um, we actually, Bobby's already ordered a handful of parts on them because we're flying them enough to be breaking them. So, yeah. but that's, we're actually trying to do some really dumb stuff though. Like Bobby's <laughs> flying through the trusses, like all kinds of ridiculous things. So, so he's on his second prop and um, I think shaft. But yeah, so so timeline us if you can, because um, you know everybody's chomping at at Drake. Um, tell us what we can expect and or how long away. So uh, with you know every factory has a capacity limit to what they can produce in a certain amount of time without having to expand their operations, and so we have to manage throughout the year. Uh, new production with what we call replenishment production. We're going into Chinese New Year. We're coming oh, out of Christmas. RC apocalypse. So right, right now, a lot of factories are cranking out as much replenishment stock as possible to make sure that all the things we ran out of through Christmas are in stock in the next two months because the next two months, they're not going to be building it. Well, in the next month, they're not going to be building anything because they'll be closed for Chinese New Year. So yeah. new releases are going to be, there's going to be a lull here. I can say that the next release is going to be awesome, uh, but I can't say when. But I would say the next you know, couple weeks in particular, it's a good time to uh, you know, take an inventory of what you got, see what you need, fix your models, get things ready for flying season. Also, over the next couple of weeks, we have a lot of our existing airplanes are going to change over to a new version that includes a smart receiver. So, for awesome. example, today, uh, I don't know if I have the list handy here. I'm going to look this up. Um, Thank you, George Yeah, Watts. so, uh, Jason, while, you, while you're about to get, you know, say what's on this list, what I'll yep, tell yep. folks is these things with the new AR631s are coming in under the radar, guys. You don't even know what's happening. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, right now, that's what happened today. Uh, we had three of those airplanes change over from the 636 to now the 631, the extra 300, the F-16 70 millimeter, Ooh. and the twin otter, as of today, are now available with the 631 instead of the 636. So the item number is the same as before. There's just an extra zero on the end. If you ever notice that, all that was is a receiver change. Nothing else changed. The motor didn't change. The ESC didn't change. The servos didn't change. The... Nothing changed on it other than the receiver. Now, if we don't have a smart ESC in that plane, you don't get a lot more functionality with a smart receiver. You do, however, have the benefit now of forward programming for AS3X and flight modes. So it is yeah. still getting you a better receiver for the same price you would have paid for the 636 before. And so a lot of those, that's what our factories have been working on over the last month or so. So a lot of that is going to happen over pretty much every week for the next couple of weeks. Those are going to be coming out kind of under the radar. Nice. Um, we're not really telling people because if you back order, if the old one runs out and we back order it, 
we'll just switch we'll switch your back order to the new one and ship you that when we get them in a, in a couple weeks. Right. Yeah, and I noticed that, that Trojan the same thing I did. happened on the Cherokee last week. You know that the one point three liter Cherokee is also available now with the six thirty one. Yeah, let me look real quick on the uh, the T twenty eight. So um, we're talking about the one point two meter now. Nice. Uh, one point two meter. I think it just sold out recently. And and of course the new Trojan I did the re release the yellow one point one had a six three one in it. Yeah, uh, I did a couple of videos on that last week, and it was really nice having. Uh, AS3X and safe in this classic, uh, proven, great entry level, you know, full potential kind of Warbird deal. Uh, yeah. That 1.1 was, you know, is one of those that when it came out back in the day, I was already past it, but I got to see that plane be recommended uh for years and years and and so many people have success with it so to bring it back with the tech and to allow it to go 4s without letting the smoke out man <laughs> i had a blast with that thing it's awesome it's fun i flew this yesterday to war i i always fly a simple plane to warm up when i get to the field and this was my warm-up plane yesterday before i flew the mustang and the fw and I ripped this thing around, basically didn't let off the throttle for like four minutes, just balls to the wall, awesome. 4S, 2200. And you guys, take the wheels and, off? Yeah, and as soon as I land, first question, no one asks me, no one says, are you having a good day? No one says, you know, how are you doing? All they ask is, is that stock? Yes. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, it's stock. <laughs> it rips now. To the moon. Yeah. It's so light. And, and I'm, you know, I think I probably... I don't remember if I, I'll have to look at the video, uh, but I, I'm, I think I did a 2200 4S in it. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a good one for that plane. But like the 1.2s, when you go 4S, the 3200 is a sweet spot. Isn't exactly. It? 22, the other day I was flying um, even my dad's turbo timber with a 4S 2200 in there, and that's I awesome. was just wrenching on it. And yeah. after like four minutes, the radio's blaring at me and i'm like what what's going on and my he had set the timer shorter i think but anyway um i just i killed the battery flat and the same thing with the p39 when i fly that thing on a 4s 2200 it's like three and a half minutes and boom i gotta land so yeah i yeah. agree on those 1.2s we're really gonna need to recommend and make sure it fits a 4s 3200 maybe even up to a 4000 if we can squeeze it in there yeah your 4000s are are not like fat you know, yeah, they're they're, they're, they're not that much bigger than a 3200, so it's like yep. yeah, and, easy. And I think yeah. that's something that a lot of folks don't realize with the smart batteries is your, your power density. You know, it, like for the yeah. same milliamp hours, you can fit a bigger spectrum battery into a plane than you could, say, uh, another brand's 3200. You could fit a Spectrum 4000 yeah. in there. Yeah, to, to be able to fly 7000s and stuff like uh, the SU-30 and the Falk Wolf. I think anybody else's 7,000 would be so big <laughs> you couldn't, get it, you, you couldn't right. get it done. Yeah, so we have higher energy density cells. We went with the lighter weight approach, uh, higher capacity in the same space. Um, and so, but a quick note on that T28 1.2 meter. Uh, I will say it's not coming back soon. Oh, man. But it will be worth the wait. Ooh, that's cool. I, I like that one, man. I, I asked you about that one the other day, and, and you were like, man, just hold off. Uh, and, you know, it, it never had safe. It, nope. sure could, it really, really should have safe because it's a perfect step up to that 1.2-meter class of Warbird. It's a good um, plane. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, imagine that thing was safe and 4S, smart. Be pretty point two, 48 inches, great logical step. You know, you think about the whole hobby is elevated. So what was great advice uh, years ago with the 1.1? One one, yeah. yeah, now, okay, cool. I've mastered that. I want to do get into retracts and flaps. How much more conf I mean, a guy could get another Trojan. Um, or, or, or if he's got some chop some way else, he could just start with if they've already got some skill. Like if you've been yeah. rocking... If you've been rocking a turbo timber and, and you're past the 
beginning stages and you can consistently pull it off with almost anything, you, you could rock a 1.2 and you could confidently do so if it were equipped with this cool tech y'all are bringing. Yeah. Man. Yep. Awesome. Yep. I think Guys, uh, I see Thomas asked about the 1.2 meter Mustang. I'm going to look that up real quick, but I'm pretty sure that one is just going through the receiver transition as well. Nice. And guys, we're going to wrap it soon, but I want to thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to wait uh, for an answer on Jason. Yeah, uh, that's all it is. It, so it's still in stock in the current form, but you know, sometime down the road, pretty much every airplane that we sell now with a 636 is going to come back with a 631 for the most part. And it'll happen throughout the next couple of months, a lot in the next couple of weeks though. No, no, are there, are so, there some of those that are the more, um, you know, let, let's call them the more advanced airplanes that come with the 636 today. Are, are some of those going to be re-released with the 637 or are we doing a 636 and all, or a 631 in, in everything? So the 637 does cost more. It has more features. Of course, it has the barometer in particular. It's got the extra ports for the additional uh, um, GPS sensor and things like that. So uh, a lot of models that are more advanced will get the 637. A lot of your sub $300, especially airplanes that don't have um, a smart ESC in them already, they're going to get the 631. Uh, so it is a there is a break point around the you know three hundred dollar mark and also the kind of um, complication level of the product and what it's capable of. So we did just the other day we were talking though you know maybe in the future we should look at planes like the Concendo which has the six thirty seven but we put the TA in maybe we should have spent a couple extra bucks and put the to you know, get the, the to the get T. the Vario yeah yeah. Yeah, the problem is it's it's really not a couple extra bucks. In the end, it ends up it would have maybe added ten to fifteen dollars to the price of the plane, and then everybody would have had to pay that. So, yeah. and then it would have broke one hundred ninety nine dollars. So, yeah, that was a that one was a tough decision. I think in the end we did it the right way, which is to keep the price down for everybody. Uh, but we're going to think about that more in the future than we had been. So, just because it's under three hundred doesn't mean it won't ever get a six thirty seven TA or a six thirty seven T. But nine times out of ten, it'll get a 631. So, uh, Kirk, I think the two-meter Trojan already has a new receiver in it. It's and 636 at the moment. It's a 636, yeah. but but it didn't used to have safe, and now it does if you get it with the 636. Yep. Um, guys express concern about the 1.2 series being discontinued, and, and, I, and I don't think that's what's happening. You're just going to see them come back with the new – receivers is what it sounds like is that correct some of them some, some of, them. of them will will not make the cut uh admittedly this poor guy didn't make the cut oh man so if you I want one it. you better get one right away because the, at the moment it doesn't get a receiver transition so uh dana has been blowing up uh the 109 so the 109 has been discontinued from fms but they could still make it would you guys ever press them to bring it on as as kind of like a not not really do it up like again but like for for w would you guys have them could you pressure them to to <laughs> put out the 109 or it just doesn't sell well uh from what i recall looking at numbers in the past which is why we chose the 190 over the 109 109s they just don't do that well they're they tougher yeah they're they're a lot tougher on the ground, and 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 that's one thing I like about you guys too is uh, you you really want people to have a good time with it and be successful, even um, choosing things like a one ninety over one hundred nine. I mean, you know, you want to sell planes in a good time, not parts. Right. Um, right. So uh, real quick, I did see this question about supporting the P-39 after it goes away. Yes, any of our airplanes that get discontinued, as long as the factory is still in business and as long as the molds are not damaged or worn out, we'll continue to buy and resell those parts for upwards of a couple of years. It's not going to be indefinite. At some point, we won't be able to order enough parts for the factory to even want to make them because as time goes on, more and more of those planes go away, less people buy parts for them. But our goal is always right around that minimum of one to two year mark. We try to support a discontinued product. Sometimes that discontinued product will be supported for 10 years. 
It just depends on the factory, their MOQs, and the mold situation. <laughs> All right, Dennis Farley, senior advisor in the house. Ladies and gentlemen, it is about that witch in the hour. Uh, Kenny's going to go on at um, 9 o'clock at Hangar 51. I thank Jason for being here from Horizon Hobby. Hopefully, Kenny's not doing like a Star Max Falk Wolf expose. That's what's happening. After. <laughs> is it real? No, I'm no he, I, I'm a funny guy. At least I think that would have been funny and would have kind of made sense. Yeah. yeah. You know, we love him. So, so he Thursday nights his and, and Friday morning, but, uh, <laughs> that's right. He goes all night. Sometimes he's deep an all into nighter. Friday afternoon. You never know. <laughs> yeah. And he then he falls asleep on other people's. Uh, <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> and he warms up. He warms up Dave's RC show. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, Guys, listen, uh, we could go on and on, but we got to pinch it. Jason, thanks for coming on. Dave, yeah, thanks, for, thanks for doing the show, dude. Yeah. Guys in the chat, if you're new to the channel, you got to check it out. Subscribe bell. If you, if you, we scratch the surface on Spectrum and you want to know more, obviously Horizon Hobby has loads of video on the Spectrum technology. And so does our buddy RC Air Marshall, who's producing the show tonight right now. So check him out. Check me out. Use the links, all that good stuff. I got the website. I got my video on our – I put out my second flight first. I usually do the shakedown, but I wanted to see if anybody noticed uh, that I didn't do the shakedown first. And I don't know if anybody's asked yet in the comments, but um, the comments are blowing up. Thank you, everybody, for checking out my video on the Falk Wolf. Um, I alluded to how quick a turnaround that was, and – uh, we have a blast doing it, but we really appreciate your support because it's hard work, man. I had a bunch of guys out there freezing their faces off. I know. <laughs> I feel bad. I saw the, the the drone pilot. Oh, it's so cold. Don't yeah. don't ever feel so bad. You quit sending me stuff. It's okay. <laughs> I'll get out there and and hurricane if I need to. Fair I've enough, got fair safe enough, yeah. technology. That's just Captain Mike, man. Don't worry about it. Yeah, they're all softies, man. I, I kind of work in and out of the weather. So, I am I mean, I'm burly, and I got enough fat that I I, I stay warm. So, yeah, no, don't don't worry. Uh, I will always deliver. Hey, so, well, that's good because the next one's going to come when it's still cold, I'm that's sure. That's awesome. Bring it on. Hey, we, we, Dude, it everybody cool. else is sending them. I got a lot of stuff coming to the channel from everybody. Uh, so, it, it's it's cool, and, and the, the weather won't hold me back too much. So, uh, Jason, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you thinking of us over here on this channel and this community. And um, we're having a blast. And uh, I, I appreciate it. I, I look forward yeah. to doing more with you. And uh, I'm glad you could do the show. It was a little bit last minute. But, uh, hey, you know, make I, the magic Air Marshal might have mentioned it. Yeah, Air Marshal, I think, mentioned it. And I was like, yeah. Because I, I kind of need help when it's, when it's an interview show. So... <laughs> I won't always think about it because there's no way I'm going to try to do it myself. Yep. yep. Um, too much technology. Guys, we'll see you at Kenny's show. Thanks so much for coming. See you in the comment section of the videos. Have fun. Fly with your friends. All that good stuff. We're going to bounce in five. Hang your rats forever. Three you later. I got to tuck the kids in. That's kind of why I'm in a hustle. <laughs> You're too good to be forgotten. We'll see you next time. Bobby K on the camera. As always, thank you so much, man. You're my dude. Thank uh, you, Bobby. See you, see you guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye.